All right, our final topic on chemical kinetics is about catalysts. So it is very often desirable to increase the rate of a reaction. And as we talked about previously, one way to speed up most chemical reactions is to increase the temperature. But there are some problems with that. It doesn't always work. Uh, in industrial applications, increasing the temperature requires energy or heat. And energy costs money, uh, so it might be too expensive to uh, increase the temperature. Um, another problem is that in biological systems, uh, living cells can only survive in a narrow temperature range. Uh, if we increase the temperature too much, we kill the cells. And so the desired reactions might be faster, but it's not any, not any good if we kill the cells. And so many biological uh, reactions that are necessary for life are too slow at temperatures at which the cells can survive. And so a catalyst is a substance that speeds up a reaction. And another important feature of a catalyst is that it's not consumed itself over the course of the reaction. So while it's involved in the reaction, it's usually reproduced before the reaction finishes. So the way that catalysts speed up the reaction is by lowering the activation energy. And if you lower the activation energy, then the reaction becomes faster. Now, catalysts don't change the thermodynamics. They don't change the relative energy of the reactants and products. And they don't create more product. We just make the same amount of product faster. Now, the way that catalysts lower the activation energy is providing a different mechanism for the reaction. And so I like this diagram because it kind of sums up a lot of the key features of catalysts. So this is a reaction energy diagram. We have the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products. And this is not a specific reaction. It's sort of a generic reaction. But in this generic reaction, the green curve represents the uncatalyzed reaction. And so this would be the activation energy of this uncatalyzed reaction. The purple curve represents the catalyzed reaction. And this is not sort of in general true, but I like the representation because we can clearly see that the catalyzed reaction must follow a different mechanism than the uncatalyzed reaction because the uncatalyzed reaction in this case uh, occurs in one step and the catalyzed reaction occurs in two steps. So the catalyst changed the mechanism. Right? And the other key feature is that the by changing the mechanism in this case, the catalyst lowered the activation energy. Instead of having this very high activation energy, it has a somewhat lower activation energy. And the other key feature of catalyst that this represents is, right, we didn't change the energy of the reactants and products. The starting energy of the reactants and the final energy of the products is not changed. Right, the catalyst worked by changing the mechanism, and the new mechanism has a lower activation energy. Now, when we talk about catalysts, we often talk about heterogeneous and homogeneous catalysts. In the case of a heterogeneous catalyst, the catalyst is a different phase than the reactants. So, right, if the reactants, as I have in this example, are all gases, uh, in this case, the catalyst is a metal surface, right? And so a solid metal, obviously different phase than these gas phase reactants. And so in the hydrogenation of, in this case, this molecule is ethene, right? What happens is the hydrogen molecules uh, get absorbed onto the metal surface. When they're on the metal surface, a reaction happens where we actually separate or break the H2 bond, and then the ethene can come in and react with the now separated hydrogen atoms. And so in this case, the catalyst has the advantage of uh, helping to break the hydrogen-hydrogen bonds it also keeps them fixed. So rather than these H2 molecules sort of running around all over the place, they're sitting still where they sort of wait for the ethene to come in and find them and smash into them and cause the reaction. A homogeneous catalyst um, is one in which the catalyst is in the same phase as the reactants and the products. And so one example of a homogeneous or a reaction that's catalyzed by homogeneous reaction is actually an unfavorable reaction, and that's compounds known as chlorofluorocarbons. 
uh, can catalyze the destruction of ozone. And these compounds used to be common in refrigerants. Uh, they've now been banned as a use of, of ref refrigerants uh, because they destroy the ozone layer. But the overall decomposition of ozone is that two ozone molecules uh, would react to form three oxygen molecules. The way this reaction is catalyzed is when these chlorofluorocarbons get up into the atmosphere, uh, UV light from the sun uh, will cause a chlorine atom, or a fluorine atom potentially, uh, to be ripped off from the rest of the molecule. And then that chlorine can react with an ozone molecule to form ClO and O2, where ClO is an intermediate, the end reacts with another ozone molecule to form chlorine and uh, two molecules of O2. Now, this example represents another important feature of catalysts. A catalyst, just like an intermediate, gets canceled out when I write the overall reaction, right? So in this case, the Cl cancels with the Cl, and the ClO cancels with the ClO. But the difference is the catalyst first appears as a reactant and then gets reproduced at, before the end of the reaction. So then the catalyst is free to go on to catalyze more reactions. That's part of what makes catalysts so efficient is that one catalyst molecule can uh, catalyze multiple reactions. And so in some instances that's good in the case of the destruction of ozone, that's actually uh, bad. Um, but the CLO is an intermediate because it first appears as a product and then gets used up before the end of the reaction. So intermediates appear first as products, then gets used up as reactants. When we look at the mechanism, a catalyst will appear first as a reactant and then it gets reproduced as a product before the end of the reaction. All right, the, the last topic related to catalysts is enzymes. So enzymes are biological catalysts. And these are huge molecules, they're proteins, and they can consist of anywhere from hundreds to many thousands of atoms. And so this is a picture of uh, a protein, and specifically a catalyst, uh, and this is how uh, biologists often represent protein molecules, including catalysts. And uh, each one of these little features, so this little feature here is called an alpha helix, and this might include uh, tens or hundreds of atoms, and you can see you have lots of alpha helices. Uh, so this represents thousands and thousands of atoms, uh, as is typical of many catalysts. And so some terminology that we use is the substrate is the molecule the enzyme acts upon, and the active site, right, among these thousands and thousands of atoms, there's going to be one particular region in the molecule uh, where the action happens, where the catalysis happens, where the substrate interacts with the catalyst. So there are sort of two competing ideas behind how catalysts work. And so one idea is called the lock and key model. And so that's the idea that the enzyme has a very specific rigid shape, the substrate or substrates have sort of the matching shape uh, so that they are sort of like keys fitting into a lock. Uh, and only molecules that have the right key shape are able to be, uh, are able to interact with the enzyme. So the shape of the molecules and the active site on the enzyme are very important. I would say a more modern model of enzymes is called the induced fit model, or sometimes this is called uh, the hand in the glove model, right? And so what happens, we suspect in this model, is that the substrates have a specific shape. It doesn't exactly match the shape of the enzyme initially, but as the substrate kind of moves in, the enzyme adopts its shape to fit the substrates, much like you know, the, when you look at a glove, it doesn't have the exact shape as your hand, but when you stick your hand into the glove, right, the glove sort of s stretches and bends or does what it needs to do for your hand to fit in. Um, I think this lock and key model is maybe the more old-fashioned model. I think most biochemists uh, probably agree that the induced fit model is probably the more accurate picture of how enzymes uh, react. The lock and key is a little bit more simplistic. Um, now, not only are the shapes important, even in the induced fit model, right, the shapes are important, right, you can't stick your foot into a glove, um, 
but intermolecular forces also play an important role. So not only does the, the active site on the enzyme have the proper shape, but if this region of the molecule is polar, right, it's only going to fit into the enzyme active site if that region is also polar, or vice versa, right, if the uh, part of the substrate that needs to interact with the active site is nonpolar, then the active site of the enzyme is going to be nonpolar.